Thank you, Margaret, for that um, introduction. What I'm going to try to do here in 20 minutes is to give an overview of this indicator that, on the one hand, is an attempt to be very clear on what's here, on the other hand, be very rigorous on the science behind that. So, the goal with this indicator is twofold also. Uh, as Margaret was alluding to earlier, the, the purpose of, of the, um, the foundation is both to look at the global governance system and how this kind of initiative can be a part of building a better global governance system, as well as helping people to understand the magnitude of the challenge we're facing. So the, the objective is then to develop a tool that will be easily understood to illustrate these risks. And I think many people have not really fully understood the kind of challenges we are facing. Uh, and that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about here now. But the first thing is to understand a little bit what is risk. Uh, in, when we talk about it in everyday life, uh, risk can mean many things. But from a risk perspective, risk is when you multiply the probability with the impact. And this is very, very important. Because this means that if the impact is very, very severe, if we're talking about something that really threatens human civilization as we know it, then it doesn't really matter if the probability is very, very low. The risk is still very high. And this is something that we tend to forget sometimes. We say that the risk is low when we mean that the probability is low. And by risk, you get a better understanding on where you should focus. Because these two things all, always must be seen together. And if you look at climate, and Bill Hare will, and, and Joanne will talk more about this later, the kind of impact we will see if the world would reach 4 degrees or 6 degrees or even more are almost unthinkable. So, and, and we will see you know, sea level rise that could be really catastrophic. We can see water scarcity, risk for global food security, uh, regional extinction of, of species and coral reefs, and large-scale biodiversity loss. We can really start shaking this planet uh, in, an, in a state where we don't know what's going to happen. So that is why we look on the impact side. That means that this is so severe that even if it's low probability, we need to look at this. And what about the probability then? Again, this is something that some of you who have been following the IPCC might have seen. Uh, but in the general discussion, it's often forgotten. We talk about it will lead to two degrees, it will lead to three degrees. But always, this is about probability. Within, usually IPCC talks about 66% probability. What we talk about is what about the 34 other percent? Some of those might be less dangerous, but some of them might be a lot more dangerous. So it, this what is called the tail that goes out from this distribution that we really must understand. And what is happening now, if you think about this uncertainty and what we do with the, with the planet is that we are putting so much CO2 into the atmosphere and greenhouse gases that this curve is moving up. And that means that this very low probability earlier has started to become not so low anymore. Now we're starting to talk about full percentage or even more for these really catastrophic events. And for the first time, in a couple of million years probably, this year for the f we saw carbon em uh, emissions concentration in the atmosphere reaching 400 ppm. And, and when we talk about these things that haven't happened in millions of years, we can understand that we are facing is something that is really unique and, and that's something that really requires reflections. And if we look at where we're heading, things start to get really scary. Uh, many of you have heard about the International Energy Agency talking about a six degree world, etc. That if we continue to do what we do, we don't have um, you know, much of a future for us. So the question is not if we're going to change, it's how fast we're going to change. So taking all this complexity, we thought that how, what is the best way for us then to introduce a global risk indicator? Should we look at the most scary reports? Should we look at the most optimistic reports? And then, well, obvious, for, uh, for climate, we have something fantastic. And this day, more than any other day, the IPCC. 
It's a unique global collaboration to really try to assess this. And from a risk perspective, this is also very interesting because what the IPCC does is trying to gather the knowledge and find the closest you can come to consensus. And uh, when you talk about risk assessment, it's very important to understand systemic risk. If you have a single study that can show that it's very dangerous or not dangerous at all, there's a tendency to that that can be a misunderstanding. There can be a systemic error in that. But if you bring a lot of studies together, like the IPC is doing, that systemic errors tends to cancel out. So that's, we started with the IPCC, what do they actually say? And then how do we translate that into probability numbers? And actually the numbers are there. It's not just being interpreted from a risk perspective. So it wasn't that much we needed to do. It was basically asking the scientists to do what they've already done. Uh, and what they have done so far, and this you cannot see. Uh, and for me this is a little bit of symptomatic of how scientists tend to be very clear, very scientific, in their perspective. But for most people, when you see something like that, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, so the first thing we said then is, okay, so Laszlo, for instance, of course, he looks at this and say, wow, this is really important and serious. People must act. But for most people looking at that, they just turn it away and say, what's on TV and what's the next thing? Uh, so how do you translate these kind of complexities into something that most people understand? But we started a process also to make sure that the policymakers who are working on that are acknowledging that. So together with the basic countries, uh, we attended uh, the conference of parties, the big climate conferences, um, to discuss this. Uh, and it was really interesting to see many of the negotiators also saying that we have acknowledged that these risks are really dangerous and we need to work with that. But we haven't really seen a pressure, we haven't really seen someone who's... who's helping us to put this on the agenda. So there was a great support from the policymakers. And then we also said, but how do you actually co uh, communicate this? And we had a joint work together with the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, uh, where we tried to look, bring some of the best communicators who've been looking at global risk together and say, how do we communicate this? How do you make it easy enough to understand, but rigorous enough to be clear on the science? So. After that process then, we then introduced and have now the Global Risk and Opportunity Indicator. And what that tried to do is just to, in a very visual way, uh, because that's the numbers, most people don't like numbers. If you have something that indicates something, you get a feeling of what's happening. But the most important thing, I think, with this indicator is comparison. When you say, for instance, that the old IPC reports for 450 ppm would result in 6 degrees with 1.8%. If I say, look, it's 1.8%, most journalists, policymakers say 1.18%, that, that's nothing. You know, who cares about those kind of low numbers? But if you compare that with fatal plane accidents, when you see people dying in airplane accidents, that the probability for that happening is one in a million. There are about 30 million flights going up and of those, 30 every year. If you compare that, if you would say that for airlines, if you put, you put, your, you put yourself on a flight and go away and say, let's fly with 1.8% probability of this plane crashing, we would have a situation where globally you would have more than half a million planes crashing every year. That would be 62 accidents an hour around the world. Uh, there are very few people who would fly in that situation. But still, that's, how, that's the kind of risk we're now putting on these really extreme climate events. And then, uh, in the afternoon, we will talk about what actually happens here with uh, R4, uh, R5. What are the latest numbers? They, they were agreed 5.30 this morning, uh, but IPCC will um, present them officially at 10 o'clock. So what, when they have done that, uh, we will present uh, our data. But before I hand over to the next speaker, I just wanted to explain a little bit about the next steps also. Where are we going from this? Uh, the response has been fantastic uh, and 
we have a bit of a challenge now to see what are the best opportunities uh, to take this forward. But one of the things that we felt are important is to illustrate the climate impact. So what does these temperatures actually mean, if you translate that? And the IPCC process, as some of you might know, is that we now had working group one presenting the basic science around climate change. Working group two will then present the impacts. So we will follow that and, and add to the indicator. But we will also in parallel start looking at other global risks. Nuclear warfare, pandemics, life science. Can we use the similar approach and how can we start looking at getting real numbers out of that? And we have encountered many groups who feel that the time is right now to bring these global challenges up on the global discussions. So, and then after that, we also continue and as you have noticed, the name is the Global Risk and Opportunity Indicator. These are opportunities being presented by solving this. And in the last IPC report, that's the focus. How do we actually deal? How do we mitigate? How do we reduce emissions? So that's what we're also going to add to that. And then finally, the links between the global risks. And this is where I think Lasso has done something that is very unique. Uh, basically, since, at least since the Second World War, the institutions on the global level has been very compartmentalized. You know, you have trade in one area, you had uh, financial in one area, biodiversity in another area. It's very little co um, really coherence between these. And what is happening when you take different, different decisions? What happens if you want to take a lot of biodiversity away and use for bioenergy? Or if you build a lot of nuclear power plants? And what happens if you don't oversee those? Will that impact the spreading of nuclear weapons? Will pandemics spread more quickly if we go into forest in a way that is not very thought through? So this is very important. And, and the complex image that Margaret showed earlier is really important because it, it's the way of trying to understand that these risks actually affect each other. So, and finally, I just want to, you know, the foundation is very much a, a bridge builder. Uh, trying to see how we can bring what you can almost call the common sense among scientists about these challenges and how we bring that out to people who can act. And that's why this group is so important also, security policy experts, financial people, the people who actually decide what we should do in the future. Uh, for climate change that is absolutely necessary. But there are other groups. So we're really reaching out a hand to you if you think this is important. Uh, how can we work together? How can we translate this in different ways? So, yeah, that's where I'm going to end. And thank you for coming. And I, maybe some of you were also up 5.30 in the morning waiting for IPCC. So, good to see you all here. Thank you.